Uh, if you're not uh, actively participating or actively asking your questions, if you don't mind taking a few extra seconds and muting uh, your microphone, that would be great. Uh, I can imagine with the weather up here in, in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, uh, there will be a lot of trucks going by. Uh, and so we want to try and minimize that background noise. I will be on mute for most of it as my seven-year-old will most certainly ask questions regarding his Lego set. So, um, and then lastly, one last simple caveat. I, I know uh, there are a lot of attendees on here uh, and you have what I would refer to as very individualized scenarios or situation and how your organization might need to address uh, the CMMC. If you can try and target your questions to more generalized uh, feelings, uh, on, on CMMC, that would be helpful, uh, just so it, it is for the good of all. And if at, at the end of it, if you still have a specific question, both myself and Mike Class, our other uh, senior account manager, uh, will be available for questions. Uh, you'll have our contact information and we could deal with your specific scenarios afterwards. So um, with that being said, I wanna make sure that this is productive and, and useful for everybody. So let meet our panelists. So uh, first and foremost is Jim Hodge. He is our director of the CMMC programming here uh, at Camin. So Jim, maybe you want to give a little quick hello. And uh, I know you don't like talking about yourself that much, but if you could maybe share a little bit about your background for the participants. All right, thanks, Brendan. Uh, I've been involved with utilizing and implementing NIST special publication guidance and recommendations for about 15 years, anywhere from government to financial to manufacturing. Um, one thing I've seen is that as much as everybody needs the same requirements, everybody is unique. And um, that's certainly where having a, a sit down and really understanding the unique situation for each individual organization um, helps me have uh, sort of that somebody to to walk you through the guidance, that's for sure. Excellent, thank you. And our second panelist uh, is someone I'm sure many of you or most of you have, have met more than twice, and that is our fearless leader, our CEO, Matt Katzer. And Matt, instead of telling people about you specifically, as, as many people have read, read some of your books, I think it would be useful, maybe share a little bit before you drop into your slides, share a little bit about Camin and, and us being an RPO or a registered practitioner organization and why we think that this not only being uh, involved with CMMC is important, but specifically why we are looking uh, ahead to being involved with the CMMC AB. Yeah, uh, thanks, Brandon. Yeah, I think it's really interesting as we go through, especially with all the you know cybersecurity attacks and what happened with Solar Winds and everything else, is we actually identify kind of a need or a trend that's going to happen. And this is called the accreditation of more of the IT industry. But also there's going to be a requirement for, especially for clients. It doesn't matter if you're doing with uh, DD activities or doing the federal government, there's going to be a ubiquitous standard put in place that we're all going to have to actually meet. And it looks like the CMMC is going to be probably be that specification that's going to be ubiquitous. So um, personally, um, I've always been interested in security. I've been involved in stuff in terms of dealing with the agency when I'm working at Intel and developing products. But it's always been something that is important to do and it's probably a cornerstone of their business. Wonderful, excellent, and, and thank you for sharing. And, and some of the uh, high level topics that you covered, we'll definitely dive into a little deeper. Um, so as I said, even though I opened saying that there's not uh, going to be a lot of slides uh, during this presentation, there are gonna be some, uh, we think it'll be valuable just to kind of uh, maybe set a baseline uh, for understanding for everyone. And so Matt, why don't you go through those and then I will put on my uh, panelist hat and we will do some Q and A with you and Jim. Okay, thanks, Brandon. Yeah, so just for everyone to uh, put a perspective, I just wanted to basically make sure we are all framed with a common set of terms. So I'm just going to spend probably a few minutes, no more than about uh, 10 minutes, to kind of talk about what we actually have and what's driving everything. And I come back to this one thing with Saudi. It's happening in the market, and it's very in, it's impactful upon us. It's impactful from you, especially in COVID. As we go through the co post COVID. We don't really see a real shift as it's going to happen is we're seeing basically a massive transformation of services and capabilities and basically technology. 
And what's happening is that, as Sadia said, he's seen two worth of digital transformation in terms of how things are done in two months. That's how fast, that we call that the speed of change. That's how fast it's actually changing. Now, when you talk about CMMC, we're talking about in terms of CAMIN and everything else is that basically it's uh, what we do is provide our licenses and we're assistance on the compliance implementation for clients. And it's alignment with Microsoft. And it's very interesting because we are actually part of the Microsoft CMMC compliance, um, CMMC acceleration program. And we're actually seeing this program now being expanded much more in the holistic standard that's actually going to affect all of us. And it doesn't matter what business we're in. We have not-for-profits that are basically have to develop and have to be at a certain level. And uh, as an RPO, we're the only RPO in Oregon, as we're basically, we have to be stewarded on these implementations. To give you what's happened in terms of trying to drive a certain standard, and you can set aside that, yeah, this originally came out of DOD, but what's happening is that we're now seeing this is filtering in through GS, uh, through the General Services Administration, and soon you're going to see it probably filters out even to the state and local governments. But basically what's happening is it's a holistic security approach. And basically, and with, a, with this, the old model that we used to all operate under is that we would get a document and we would sign the document that we attest to it and everything else. And so there, and we didn't really know, and sometimes the clients didn't really know if they implemented things or not implemented things. And what's happening now is that there's going to be an accreditation standard and an audit process that has to be gone through to make sure you're doing what you're doing. I mean, this is a classic in terms of business at ourselves is that, you know, whatever, you know, whatever measured improves. And that's a simple axiom for any business we do. It doesn't matter if we do calls. It doesn't matter if we do leads. It doesn't matter how we do production. It doesn't matter what activity is. It's all based on measuring and basically improving it. And give you kind of the history where this came from is it came from this whole stretch. And I, I gathered this slide from some DOD work because it's very visual on what's happening is that people used to look at security as a something you would add on as a separate pillar. And what's happening in all of our business, especially with Microsoft 365 stack, it's basically cybersecurity is a core component and you build the necessary programs and processes on top of that. And that's how we approach and come in and we approach our clients, both in the corporate space and in the and def, and defense industrial complex space. We approach it from a standpoint is that cybersecurity is core to the business. Now, what they're trying, what CMNC also is trying to look at, they have this model known as a domain model. And what this basically means is that when you look at how you do things in a business, you have a combination of practices and processes. And these are SOPs that are written to basically put in place in terms of how you're supposed to do things. And those are kind of the process models that you have. We all have them for business. You have to have them because as a business, you can't have a you can't have a process structure and practices. You can't grow. And so CMNC is building off this. So it's building off saying, OK, let's put a set of documented um, practices in place and let's make sure those processes to implement those things and follow through. And that was the basis of it, of CMMC. And the course of being the, in the federal government looking at what it's trying to do, they really were after two things. They're trying to protect what we call federal contract information. And the other is they're trying to protect is controlled unclassified information. So what happens with this, and this is, you see this even in grants to organizations to not-for-profit, just when you actually have a federal contract or grant or activity, information in that is protected and it's not supposed to be shared. If it's not public, it's not supposed to be shared. And to give you basis of, so make sure we're all using the same definitions, is that for FCI, the foundation of it is basically, uh, it means that information is not intended for public release, and that's key. And that's key when you actually have any type of grant or agreement with the federal government. Now you have also what we call controlled unclassified information. This demands a higher level of security control. And that's information that is created, that's either the government creates, gives to an organization, or the organization creates on behalf of the government under a contract. 
And what's really interesting is when you look at it through like the National Archives, there's a definition of it. I mean, it's the point of what the Department of Natural Resources does. It's the part, it's getting to the point of what states do. Information controlled that basically needs to be restricted for access and you have to have a certain security for it. And we use the other term frequently for called GCC high. In this case, this is a version of office restricted, restricted for a government or defense contractor in order to actually manage that controlled unclassified inf information. Some other definitions just so that we um, have some of these things and uh, granted where I'm moving rather quickly through some of this slides, but I just wanted to give you an idea of some of the terms. So in case you came across them, um, you know, for instance, Brandon Measure, we're a, reg we're a registered uh, uh, practitioner organization. So basically it's uh, composed of a group of RP. These are individuals that have uh, basically passed a certain level of accreditation with the CMMC to basically understand and do assessments and uh, implementations. And then you have certified assessors, which is basically that's the formal assessment that you actually go through. And it's interesting to keep in mind, and this is what's going to happen throughout the industry, is that you're going to have implementers such as us as Kamen, who's an RPO, that help you implement in terms of the different specifications of what's required. And then you're going to have an assessor, which is independent of the implementers that come through and basically do an assessment slash audit of the environment. And assessment is actually used rather than an audit because a audit is basically when you come across an audit, there's like a checklist. You do A, B, C, D and everything. It's yes or no and stuff like that. An assessment is much more fluid because an assessment is, is the organization living up to the implementation of the CMMC? So that's why we have this term certified assessors. And then of course you have the um, third party organizations, C3POs. They are basically the organization that's going to basically manage the assessments and the accreditation body, which we all are basically as an RPO we're responsible to, is the CMMCAB. And they kind of manage the activity. It's a nonprofit organization independent of the government that basically manage the accreditors, make sure things happen. So when does this happen? And that's been the big questions that people have. And it's really, this is kind of a pretty good timeline. I mean, the, the numbers that really looking at it is it's 2026. Now we're saying that's a long time away, but 2026 contracts means November 1st, 2025. And in order to actually do CMC accreditation, that means you have to back up and you have to have implementation of the practices by November 1st, 2024, because you're starting to actually roll those processes in. It's a maturity process. It's how we're conducting our day-to-day -day activity. And which puts us in now and we're 2021. So we basically are looking at a, a two, three year period that we have to actually implement things. Now, if you look at this, the real nut on this whole thing is there's an estimated 320 companies that are doing business just with the Department of Defense that are basically um, have come under this guidelines. So, and we had an earlier discussion today it was talking about accreditation, for instance, you could have a situation where you have, um, let's say you have some uh, company is producing a widget. It could be a nut under a federal contract from some uh, prime company. It may be actually flow down. There may be a couple of different subcontractors in the flu. And at the far end, that person's actually actually doing that, producing that little widget that uh, goes on something that who knows what it is. These probably have it. There's federal contract information associated with it. So that company that is producing the widget at the minimum is going to have to put the necessary production at the level one. Now, the impact for us as organization, as a provider organization, as an IT service provider, well, we're going to come in contact with that information in that company. Therefore, we're going to actually have to make sure that our processes of our company meets the level of requirements that actually touch for that client. So if they're a level one requirement, we have to meet level one re, uh, responsibility. And, and so you can actually see how this basically scales up. So suddenly you're talking about 320,000 companies that basically have a contract requirement 
Now it's all the service entities that are basically going to have to change and change their business processes and how they do things. And that's the impact that we're actually going to see because it's not just those companies, it's literally will turn probably close to probably 70 or 80% of people doing business in the, in the United States are going to have to have some type of compliance put on top of them. And it's going to have to be accredited. So with that, I'll kind of give you an idea of where, the, where it's happening with the schedule. And like, like what I like to try to do, let's turn it over to Mr. Brandon to see what our panel thinks. Wonderful, thank you, Matt. And I, I always know uh, the uh, timeline is something very important because when you say, oh, 2026, I, I know uh, customers that I have spoken to, they think, well, I can start in 2026. And that certainly isn't the case. But I want to uh, back up a little bit. And Jim, uh, your expertise is not only in the CMMC, but also you have a strong background in NIST 800-171. And I think it would be important, and this was a, a customer had this exact question uh, two days ago. Uh, can you uh, I guess lay a foundation for what NIST 800-171 is and explain to our uh, participants kind of the difference or the evolution of NIST 800-171 into the CMMC. Yeah, uh, so NIST of course has SPs, special publications that cover a wide range of just stuff, whether it be how to properly implement uh, various passwords, how to um, secure systems that are involved in federal processing of data. And uh, so some of these uh, documents are quite lengthy and NIST uh, SP-800-171 kind of has that 171 for 171 controls, sort of that uh, nomenclature there. And this kind of provides a, a very, um, the breadth and depth of securing an environment and best practices and recommendations. And so it, it doesn't focus on any one thing like some of the other special publications do. Some of the other special publications, for example, focus on a particular system or a particular process. So 171 really is all encompassing for quite a bit of your environment. Now, some of the differences between 800-171 and what CMMC is trying to accomplish is 800-171 there are practices you can implement and depending on what your environment is, nobody has held you accountable to those. So for example, you may implement a screen inactivity timeout policy. If nobody has any activity at a computer for uh, an entire hour, then it automatically locks itself. While it's good to have that, that's a bit long. For it to be just five minutes, that's a bit quick. So that's where um, some of the 171 guidance is beneficial and that it gives you a path to walk on, but it, it doesn't necessarily say this is what is recommended um, for your specific environment. It's just a, a general recommendation. So CMMC, what that's trying to do is say, here are these controls, depending on the level in which you're trying to be assessed against for CMMC. Here are these controls, and but we want it to make it better for you. And so um, it, while it may have using the screen timeout policy example, while you may have that, where's the actual policy or document that states you implement this in your organization? And so as much as it does create additional work, it, CMMC really is about saying, look, you've been doing this for the past 5, 10, 15 years, but now let's, let's, let's make this process of yours a little bit better how you're securing your environment. Awesome, thank you, and and I, I think that is that, that's definitely an important distinction, and something you brought up, Jim, uh, you used some verbiage that is very specific uh, to the the CMMCAB. Uh, Matt, I, I think it'll be helpful for our participants to understand uh, the difference between what is a practice and what is a process. Well, yeah, that's actually uh, that's actually very good. We a lot of people get these confused and everything else. And we look at our organization, we look at uh, basically as a kind of a level one organization, all of the practices that are basically put in place is all ad hoc. And that's an easy way to look at it is there's stuff that you just tend to do and you just tend to implement it. And so when you look at processes, we're really looking at saying, okay, let's go look at this, 
what's our standard operating procedures, how do we actually document the processes, and how do we put it in place to make sure that what we're practicing maps into what our process model has. And that's kind of the easiest way to look at it is that we want, and that's what the, and what the whole purpose of the cybersecurity maturity model certification is that when they talk about maturity model, they're talking about organization maturity to implement a bunch of uh, practices that conform to the standard processes that the organization use. Now, we all have to keep, since we're all running growing businesses, we have to basically make sure how do we do this in such a way that we're agile and we can be uh, competitive and innovative. Excellent, and and I think you, you you gave us a really it's like I gave you my notes. It, you gave us a really good jumping off point for our next question. And also, um, uh, participants, if you do have a question, um, th there's the little hand raise button uh, that is part of uh, Microsoft Teams. And what's cool is when you press it, it shoots your name right up to the top of the list. And so I will know that you are asking a question. And I'll make sure to pause everybody uh, to do so. So if something comes up and you want to know it, just raise your hand, and I'll make sure that we jump to you. Uh, but back to Jim. And so Matt sort of mentioned, you know, the difference between practices and processes, and this becomes essential to the maturity level uh, associated with your organization. And maybe not everybody knows, you know, kind of the different levels. And so I think uh, a key component to understanding uh, the CMMC is understanding the difference really between ML1, ML3, and ML5. And maybe you could share a little bit for our, our participants, kind of the, the, the primary differences, or, or as, I, as I refer to it when I first introduced it, uh, the, the maturity levels for dummies, if you will. <laughs> yeah, sure thing. So uh, CMMC right, is a maturity model, and as has been mentioned before with the acronyms FCI and CUI, so it's about escalating the level of effort to safeguard information. I mean, that really is what the uh, stepping up is from level one up to, well, through level five. So level one will be more about protecting FCI. Uh, and that's why it has 17 practices. It, it, it's kind of a, I don't want to say it's a minimal level of effort because it, it still is a level of effort to implement it. However, it's not, uh, as robust as, for example, all the practices you have to meet for level five. And then level two is really the transition between level one and level three. Level three, at that point, you're trying to safeguard CUI. And um, all CUI is FCI, but all FCI is not CUI. So that's why level one can be a little bit more relaxed in terms of the number of controls that need to be implemented. Level three, that's where you'll run into 130 controls to protect CUI. And at this point, you have to be mature or maturing in both the practice and the process. Level one, you don't have to have as much documentation. You need to show to the auditor that you are doing something. However, um, you can um, you can do some things uh, and get away with it in level one that you cannot in level three in terms of when you are actually assessed. So level three is when you start to have the practice and process um, object evidence where you need to provide the, uh, the assessor how, how it is that you do something. Again, uh, setting a password policy, for example. If, if your system administrator or your IT um, department just simply sets a strong password policy, that's great um, in terms of the technical side, but the administrative side of it, the, the actual policy document, where is that? Does that exist? Does it not? Well, that's something that you would be assessed against, certainly level three and level five. And if you don't have that, then you fail at that particular uh, control. So going from level three to level five, um, Level four is really the transition. Level five at that point, you are really protecting against advanced persistent threats, um, nation state attackers. The level of effort is, is a, a lot more robust at that point. You, you very likely have a fully built out IT team. Very likely you have um, IT partners to help you provide 24 seven operations or certainly some amount of um, coverage that that your, your folks may not have and so you outsource some of that to other organizations that do 
have the uh, knowledge, skills, and abilities to help fill in those gaps. And that's exactly what the auditor would want to see. And then, um, yeah, just the level of effort about the, the maturing piece of it. You know, you can't just create a policy document and implement a strong password policy and be done with it. Um, NIST, even uh, even the government, right, has changed their recommendations over the years about passwords themselves. Everybody creates a password, pretty much that starts with the capital letter, has maybe seven to eight, you know, random characters, and then ends with a special character, right? You, you can put that mask into a password cracker, and there's a good chance most of the folks in your organization, their password matches that exact mask. And so it's more about a passphrase. You know, if you look at your desk to the left, and if you have a green plant, you could say. Your password, your passphrase could be, I have a green desk to my left. Uh, I have a green plant on my desk to my left. And when it comes to passwords, it's more about entropy, which is the length, and less about complexity because no human is going to remember all that stuff. So again, right, it's about maturing how you implement practices over time and less about just having them. Awesome. Re really great explanation, Jim. I, I appreciate that. Um, so, Matt, I, I want to kind of transition the, the when we originally sent this out, the, the topic was mining the gap and we're still in many ways uh, mind the gap, which is a, a fun a British term uh, for the tube as they like to refer to it. Um, but I, I think it'd be important for everybody to understand there in all likelihood, you're pro many of our customers who are on the call probably think they're doing most of this, but they might not. And so thinking of that, where do you think it, it, having having you know, done some of this work, where do you think our customers and, and participants are sort of missing the mark uh, as of this moment or where where should their attention be drawn to a, a kind of a, a day one when they're starting to look to be CMMC compliant? Hey, Brendan, that's really a super good question. And I mean, the big issue, and it comes back to something that we all um, um, growing up with in terms of business environment, is uh, what gets uh, what gets measured improves and what gets tracked improves exponentially. And when you look at a anything that you're doing, if anything you're collecting information, you're doing different type of activity, that's the key thing. And when you look at what the CMMC is, it's basically saying that how do you actually put a um, a model in place where we basically define what we're going to do and track the characteristics of it. So what CMC is that one of the key components of it is the audit management and tracking. Are we doing what we're doing? And it's all at all levels, level one through five. And are we actually doing? And in fact, you look at what we do in our security programs for our guard security program, for instance, is we're doing a lot of the level one requirements where we're actually tracking and auditing those things to make sure that we're doing the necessary things that we're supposed to be doing to keep, you know, keep the environment safe. And you're doing it this way, not because you want security to get in way. You're doing it this way so that you can look at your business and how do you basically structure your business so that you have clarity of what people are doing, but also you have clarity that you know that things are being addressed and taken care of so you can spend that mental effort, that mental energy on the things necessary to grow the business. So that's what the things you want to look at, and that's kind of important when you are uh, trying to get started as you look at CMMC. It's really, you got to get a baseline. You got to basically either do a gap assessment with what you have, and you have to develop the processes necessary to tell you what's actually different and how you need to improve. Awesome, and, and establishing that baseline, uh, Jim, this is something that uh, I have learned uh, in, in, in the training and Matt sort of mentioned, you know, things like the software that's in your environment and, you know, physical hardware. Um, everybody thinks cybersecurity. They just think, oh, I, my email got hacked. In CMMC, is that the case? Are we just dealing with email hacks or are we dealing with more? With CMMC, it's certainly more. Um, so when it comes to security controls, you typically have physical, technical and administrative. And some of the administrative would be kind of your policy documents. Technical is, you know, how you implement those uh, policies and physical, of course, is physical. So in your example of an email hack via phishing, uh, you know, if if there is an administrative policy that states you will not use your work email address 
for personal purposes, you know, maybe uh, some travel company, right? You want to get the latest and greatest deal. So, you know, you've used your work email to um, sign up for, you know, those newsletters, right? So right there, right, th th there's the administrative policy that's supposed to stop that, but that's just, you know, black and white, that's a document. So the actual technical piece would be, um, you know, your uh, email appliance. You know, is it is it is it eliminating those types of emails um, from coming into the environment in the first place? And maybe you have some sort of uh, edge appliance to protect uh, kind of on the outside of um, allowing those types of communications in. So maybe you have it, but you don't actually have it configured, right? So that's that's a, a technical security control that has not been met. And then in this particular example, physical doesn't play as much of a role. However, that is still a piece of CMMC because it does have um, physical access uh, requirements and other physical controls that will be assessed against. And so getting back though to the example of phishing is that if, if your organization has never had um, proper training, either you know, bringing in an outside party or utilizing uh, one of the various vendors that are out there, then right, it, unfortunately, that is a very, very common way for a bad actor to have, a, have an in to a network. And it, it is not going to go away anytime soon. And it only is becoming more and more prevalent. So for an organization to, to recognize they've never formally had training, and to say, you know, th this is absolutely a threat to us, then let's look into um, right, how do we provide that formal training? And that right there is exactly what an assessor wants to see. That's exactly the definition of, you know, you're maturing a process. And so, you know, you can onboard that, that training, you can have it, but it doesn't just stop there. You know, there's always, almost always going to be at least one individual that clicks on a link, you know, the whole thick, uh, think before you click sort of mantra. And, you know, so what happens after that? Well, there's the remediation training. And so, again, it's about not just doing something to satisfy a, a check in the box. It's what are you doing to not just do that, but where, what's the call to action? How do you improve that baseline? You know, how do you how do you make something better and 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 not. Um, again, not just meeting the bare minimum. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, no, that, I think that really helps. And, and actually, uh, Jim, your question actually uh, got uh, sp uh, sprung up a question. Uh, uh, it came up via chat to me. Um, and, and Matt, maybe this will help. So uh, they basically said, this sounds like a lot. Um, and we're, we are a nonprofit uh, here in Portland, Oregon. Um, do we really have to go through all this? And, and if so, when should we do it? How would we uh, start to approach it? So I guess it's, it's a real general question, but uh, I'm guessing uh, the context here is they don't sell you know, weapons to the military. They're just a nonprofit. Do they really need to do this? So I, I, I think that's, that, that if, I, if, if I summarize the question correctly, great. If not, somebody help me out here. Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually a really good question. I mean, if you look at like, um, you know, it's a lot of it will come down to in terms of contract, what information to have. And most of the time it's going to be FCI for like the not for profits. And this is why it's interesting when we actually look like our guard security program, we actually deploy all the technical parts and everything else associated with basically a level one, because what level one really, if you get right down to it, is the common sense stuff that you need to do. I mean, are you deploying MFA? I mean, those type of activities is that do you actually have, uh, you know, in terms of uh, safeguarding information, do you have the necessary tracking processes and control people coming in and out of your facilities? You know, like you, you know, like you do is things locked up is what is the process that you put in place? And a lot of this, if you look at like what level one is, it's just common sense things that you need to do. Um, for example, you know, it's great to have like 365 and everything else, but do you actually look at the audit logs? Do you actually go through and um, go look at what the threats are coming through? Do you actually go through and do you actually even have some of the advanced spam filters configured on it? 
Um, if you're doing like in, um, you're doing any type of HIPAA or any type of anything else associated with like the, uh, um, you know, SEC stuff and everything else or doing that with financial documents, you're going to probably have a third party um, testing of all your employees to make sure how they know what links to click on and what links they shouldn't click on. Those are the things that you have in terms of a level one. And that's the type of capabilities that you actually look at. And um, how to actually do this, and if you actually go back to what the requirements or the, you know, the CMC requirements are, is by the time you go look at the timeline, going back to like um, November 1st of 2025, you have to be accredited by that time for the contract level you want to go bid on. Well, block it into today, and you're looking at it as an organization is saying that, well, let me go look at these 17 controls and what am I actually doing in today? And how can I actually start building this into my culture? That's really the secret. And if you take that approach, it's actually easy to accomplish these things because it's built, it's part of your process and it's part of your cyber maturity uh, that you actually have in the organization. And so that's my thing is that start small, look at the 17 controls, and you'll find that you pretty much are doing a lot of these things already. You just haven't realized that you're doing it. And then let's write the processes around them. Awesome. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Matt. All right. So now we have a, a question from the audience. It is our, our friend Chris, uh, who is yeah, here locally. Uh, Chris, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself. And uh, Matt, based on the question he sent me, this definitely sounds like it's someone a question for someone who wrote a book on Microsoft licensing for an, to answer. <laughs> so, Chris, you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, my question is, um, when it comes to CMMC, do the standard Microsoft 365 E3 or E5 based ATP licenses work? Or is there a need for the government level licensing? Um, that's a good question. What it really comes down to and this is a screen that I have, is that it really comes down to what information that you actually have. Okay. If you're, and that's gonna be the detecting of, and so if you're just dealing with like FCI information, for instance, uh, level one, level two FCI information, and it's gonna be dictated by the contract, the standard Microsoft um, uh, 365 license mix, and there's something known as the 365, um, uh, we have the Office 360, there's a, CMMC Microsoft placemat that actually will tell you which controls and which licensing map in. And you can handle with the corporate licenses for like level one and level two. Level three, when you start getting CUI information, it's a different, there's a different set of requirements. And what it really drives down on the requirements are um, which, uh, who, which type of people can access the information. Are you, are you a citizen? Are you? A, uh, do you have a um, green card? What are you a resident? What is the type of information have? And so you have to look at who has access or who needs to know, and that's how you determine your controls on it. So, like majority of what I think the people are going to face with is is probably using the Microsoft security suites, um, the E3 with the ATP plan one, plan two and it meets in doing the auditing, you're gonna meet level one and um, most of the level two requirements in it. Okay, thank you. Awesome, and Jim, it looks like you, you wanted to add something to that or, or maybe uh, uh, dive a little deeper into that topic. It, yeah, so I, I will, uh, I can speak a heck of a lot better from the security engineering perspective of, of those components that are utilized and if somebody has never taken a look at even just Windows event logs on their own computer, whether it be at work or at home, there is a tremendous amount of information that is generated, even within a five minute period. And when you start to incorporate a um, like a SIM product, so a security information and event management product like Sentinel, it, it, that's going to aggregate all that data and, and you are going to have an infusion of, of log data from all your different machines and assets into a SIM, for example, Sentinel. And it, if, if you don't have anybody on staff that has a tremendous amount of extra time or even the experience, 
it is going to be again just a tremendous amount of overload of information and that and that's you know if your if your sim if sentinel isn't even configured properly even when configured properly it's still a lot of information that really does warrant a a review of it and you know for example do you have a system administrator in your environment that that should be changing passwords probably so should they be doing it a saturday you know morning at 2 a.m well maybe not and so you know but those are things you would not even know if it wasn't logged somewhere okay so now it's being logged so you know who, you know who whom on your staff is going to see that log amongst the literally thousands that get generated and so that's where having a properly configured sim really can can be an asset in your organization but then again there's still a level of effort in the time to, to review all that and that's just a sim right that, that that's just the the log data that you need to be reviewed on that that doesn't include all the other um, products that are included in those licenses that are, are part of the security suite that absolutely need to be reviewed as well. So I, I'll just say from, from the security engineer's perspective, it, it's a tremendous level of effort to, to go over all that data properly and not just to receive it and then close it out just to close it out. Because again, right, it's about that, that maturity process. Do you have something in place, a SIM? Yes. Well, show me you actually use it for what it's worth. Well, if you can't, again, there's that that practice and that process that, um, you know, possibly you would, you would be uh, receive a fail against from an assessor. Awesome. And, and thank you, Chris, uh, for, for the question. And, and Jim, thank you for the follow up. And I think you led uh, Jim uh, nicely into my next question. And I, I think, uh, Matt, you, you could probably touch on this for our participants. And um, so we've talked a lot about uh, how to become more mature or establish maturity, but we haven't really gone to that final step. And that final step is, um, you know, the actual accreditation process. So we've used terms like a test. We've used terms like object evidence and accreditation. Matt, could you maybe explain to the, to the folks uh, as we know it, because you know, certainly it hasn't happened yet, but what, what, what does it mean to attest to something? What does it mean to, to receive an accreditation? What's object evidence? Uh, so they know what will be uh, lying ahead for them in the future. Yeah, and that's actually a good question is that, um, so when you actually look in terms of like uh, NIST, is, uh, NIST 800 171 is a good example. Um, in this past November, the if you're doing business federal government, there's something known as uh, SPURS uh, supplier performance requirement uh, system. You basic what you have to actually do is take the NIST 800 and says, did I do uh, control one, control two, and you have a list and you basically get a score. And then at the end, then you upload the score into the, um, you know, the uh, for the supplier performance system. And that's actually, and that's the score that you have and that rates you. You're attesting to that. There's really no, um, there's no, uh, no one coming through to assess. Are you doing what you're supposed to do? It's basically going on your, um, what you said you're going to do and you're attesting it so everybody assume that you're following through and you've been truthful on it and that's why the system is set up in the past that's what we call we mean attesting when we talk about um, accreditation means that what happens is that and then this is where accreditation is a little bit different than an, uh, an audit um, an audit for instance would be here's my checklist of 10 things did you do a b c d and e and the accreditation assessment is different because they basically said, OK, um, here is the um, cybersecurity maturity model level one. Um, and let's look at the 17 controls and let's go through and assess. Do you put the practices in place to actually do what you're saying to do? Do you have the processes in place to do what you're saying to do? So it's an assessment of that activity. And that's really and so when you talk about when you talk about getting accreditation, accreditation is going through and saying that, how do you actually, are you doing what you're saying you're doing? And then the next part of the assessor is gonna look at is how can you prove that you're doing what you're doing? And that's called the object evidence. Where, so there's three things when you look at it is that you have the process documents to say, hey, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I have the object evidence is that basically, and it could be simple in some cases for level one where you basically have a uh, video recording of how you're going about uh, triaging or reviewing audit logs or things like that. 
And of course, with the uh, with the timestamps, when you actually look at the auto log and loading that information up for the assessor to review. So that's kind of the real difference is that attesting you're you're saying that you did what you did and everybody's assume that you did it. Assessment is basically you have to actually show that you actually have implemented and you actually put the processes and practices in place. And the object evidence is the demonstration or the information associated to prove that you did what you did. Awesome, thank you, Matt. And and I think uh, uh, kind of parsing it out for, for our customers is, is really important to understand. Uh, Jim, I, I think it's a cool follow up. Um, you and I have been working with a handful of customers and, and looking at uh, kind of a, a high level view of, of what they're currently operating under what they're currently doing, uh, you have uh, raised the red flag early and said, hey, just so you know, if you're doing this right now, that is a hard fail. Like you don't even have to go through any of the extra assessments. You're not going to pass regardless. Maybe some things that uh, I'm not saying uh, to use an example, Chris, I'm, we're not accusing you of doing this, but uh, is there something that you think some uh, customers might be currently doing that would be that hard fail that maybe they should right now just get on top of, get ahead of? I think that would be helpful for them to understand. Sure. So, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, tech refresh is is a thing that exists and is real. And for some organizations, uh, you know, I completely get it. If replacing your computer with something newer really doesn't increase your revenue, then why why do it? I get it. However, when you do start to be assessed for things like this, specifically CMMC, unfortunately, again, that's part of that maturity. And maturity, right, as we said, technical, administrative, physical, culture even, right? I know that's one thing that, that may not be talked about as much, but culture, right? Well, what's the, if your company culture has never been to lock your computers because it's a hindrance to unlock it when you get back to your desk, uh, as a security person, I will almost never tell you that security is, is fun and convenient. It is a hindrance, no doubt about it. However, right, if you have it ingrained in your organization that when you walk away from your computer, lock your screen, right? It's simple. Windows key L. <laughs> you don't have to do anything more than that, right? It, it's it's about that culture, and and that's something that doesn't necessarily come up as as an administrative, uh, technical or or physical security control, and so, um, it, you know, uh, so that would be part of of an auto fail is you know if you just have not wanted to replace your your Windows Seven computers or your you know your older Windows Server operating systems. Uh, so EOL is end of life, and a lot of those older pieces of software that worked great in the past have reached end of life. Uh, you need to have software that is officially supported by a vendor, by a vendor. And if it's reached end of life, it usually is not, and that would be an auto fail. Um, again, practice versus process. If you just absolutely hate documentation and don't want to create, you know, SOPs and policies, and you know the black and white, well, you know you're going to be assessed against it, certainly at level three and higher. And if you just simply don't want to do that, that's going to be an autofill because that's exactly one thing that the assessor will look for is that object evidence. Object evidence can be a screenshot. It can be configuration um, export. It could be, um, it, you know, again, just simply a printout that you have something. And but you got to prove it, right? You got to have that object evidence. So if you just simply don't want to do it or, you know, you just choose not to for whatever reason, some of those would be um, auto fails. And again, lack of maturity. Uh, you know, have you been maturing your processes? If not, well, that's the M and uh, and CMMC, well, one of the two M's. And, you know, it's like, again, from, from a business owner's perspective, I understand that what you've been doing for the past 20 years works. You don't want to change. I get it. However, change is happening one way or another. And you're either going to hop on board with it or you're going to continue operations as before. And you're going to unfortunately miss out on some of uh, the government contracts that are out there. And I assure you, right, your, your competitors are noticing what's being required of them. And that right there is simply a competitive advantage. Hopping on board that train now, uh, understanding what your gaps are, working towards filling in those gaps so you have a very solid foundation. So when you do get assessed against whatever maturity level uh, you're going for, you're already golden. Awesome, Jim. And, and uh, I have 
we, we booked this for the full hour. Um, I, I think we're, if there's any other questions, uh, don't hesitate, but, but Matt, I think, uh, Jim kind of led into what I think is, is a really good solid final question. And that is for, you know, our customers on here. Um, gosh, that was a lot of information. Uh, where do I start and when do I start? <laughs> Well, that's a good question, and thanks as a segue, and I guess that's a real question come about is how do you actually get started? And really, what you have to actually do, and the best thing to do is kind of reach out and schedule a consulting appointment with my, uh, with uh, Brendan or Mike and basically understand it, and really understand what, you're, what you actually have. This is a screenshot of the uh, domains, the areas that you have to look at. And but if you're like Chris has mentioned, he had a question about the, the licensing. We have this document known as a CMMC placemat that actually matches the different license mixes to what they actually mean and how you actually deploy it. So how you actually get started is that you got to get on the right subscriptions. Um, that's kind of the important part of it, but you also have to define what you're trying to accomplish and do because the pieces are there. I mean, for instance, for with with us and we the clients that we actually manage any security program, anything else, we actually deploy like Azure Sentinel. And so like Azure Sentinel, this is a plugin that Microsoft has made to actually will go through and look at the maturity level and you can select the maturity level and actually see how you actually deployed and what needs to be changed. So there's a lot of tools to help you. So you can want to do things like uh, do it yourself and do the integration like uh, like on this diagram right here, you see like, hey, you need to have sign in logs if you're actually doing in terms of looking at this particular control and you got to enable the after directory premium if you don't have a trial to kind of turn those pieces on because you need to do the necessary audits those are the things that those are the things that you actually have when you look at when you look at when you look at stuff like that like these things here this is what it actually gets you and when you actually do an azure sentinel deployment so how can we really help you it's really, it's a couple of things. You can actually look at the, you know, different types of webinars that we actually have in terms of trying to you know, get started. We have a gotcha, we're actually gonna move this out into um, later on in March, but also we have like the attend into the breach where you actually see how you actually defend your environment. But really from a process standpoint, what you wanna do is you gotta get into what we call a readiness check. And you can actually go through and you can get this, uh, reach out to Brendan or, my, uh, Brendan or Mike and get a copy of the CMNC placemat and then just see where you actually are. Now, granted, this across the board is tailored for like uh, CMC level three, but you can actually see on the placemat itself for the different controls that it actually has. And then when you actually look at the controls, you can actually go through and say that, okay, well, this control is for, a, this is for an access control for uh, AC1, which is level one, and it will get you a roadmap so what you need to do. So you don't have to upgrade to higher end up subscriptions. You can get to one of those things, you know what you need to do. And the key thing is that you need to basically look at this, use the placement as your guide, and then also you can actually talk to, you know, one of our consultants and everything else and get an idea of, what it is and book a 15 minute call with one of our practitioners and get an understanding or call uh, Mike and Brennan directly. And what we'll also do is that to kind of help you along the way, we're going to give you a, we'll send you this placemat, just go fill out a form um, from that www.cam.com slash feedback and let us know what you thought about this uh, format we gave today and we'll send you this placemat. But really, get your started is that um, get the placemat, look at the look at what it has and what your subscription mix it is and book a 15 minute call with one of our practitioners to understand you know what we can actually do or what changes you need to do to actually get to the get to that next level and get the pro get the practices and processes in place and with that I says that I want to turn it back over to Brendan but you know it's really trying to let's you know, it's, you know, CMMC is very simple. It's a process and you just need to start it. And it's easy to start and it's easy to move forward. 
Awesome. Uh, Matt, thank you so much uh, for all the participants. Uh, I went ahead in the chat window um, and I put the uh, direct link into the feedback there. So uh, you don't even, if you didn't write it down, don't worry. So you can go ahead and click it. Um, I want to thank uh, everybody for joining today. Uh, thank you, Chris. You should probably get some sort of prize because you were the first one to ask a, a live question. So maybe we can get you something, but uh, really appreciate everybody participating. Thank you uh, for your attention and, and braving the elements outside, even though most of us are inside today. Um, but if there's no more questions, it uh, looks like everybody will get about a minute or two back to their day, which is always valuable. Um, and as Matt said, uh, be on the lookout. We'll be doing some more webinars, uh, not only about CMMC, but also there'll be some Microsoft licensing uh, questions. So Chris, uh, we'll probably touch on your specific question more in depth there. Uh, but everybody, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and we look forward to working with you on the CMMC going forward. Uh, if that's it, everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you. It's really valuable, guys. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Thank you.